Part one of Book eight of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume two, Part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume two, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book eight, Part one. A society has been formed in London for the assistance of men of letters, both English and foreign. This society invited me to its annual meeting. I made it my duty to attend and to present my subscription. His Royal Highness the Duke of York occupied the chair. On his right were the Duke of Somerset and Lords Torrington and Bolton. I myself sat on his left. I met my friend Mr. Canning there. The poet, orator and illustrious minister made a speech in which occurred the following passage which did me too great honour, and which was reported in the newspapers. Although the person of my noble friend, the ambassador of France, is as yet but little known here, his character and writings are well known to all Europe. He began his career by expounding the principles of Christianity, and continued it by defending those of monarchy, and now he comes amongst us to unite the two countries by the common bonds of monarchical principles and Christian virtues. It is many years since Mr. Canning, the man of letters, improved himself by the political lessons of Mr. Pitt. It is almost the same number of years since I began obscurely to write in that same English capital. Both of us have attained high station, and are now members of a society devoted to the relief of unfortunate authors. Is it the affinity of our grandeurs, or the relation of our sufferings, that brought us together in this place? What should the governor of the East Indies and the French ambassador be doing at the banquet of the afflicted muses? It was rather George Canning and François de Chateaubriand who sat down to it, in remembrance of their former adversity, and perhaps of their former happiness. They drank to the memory of Homer, singing his verses for a morsel of bread. If the literary fund had existed when I arrived in London from Southampton on the 21st of May, 1793, it would perhaps have paid a doctor's visit to the garret in Holborn, in which my cousin, de la Buertade, son of my uncle de Bede, harboured me. It had been hoped that the change of air would do marvels towards restoring to me the strength essential to a soldier's life. But my health, instead of recovering, declined. My chest became involved. I was thin and pale. I coughed frequently. I breathed with difficulty. I had attacks of perspiration, and I spat blood. My friends, who were as poor as I, dragged me from doctor to doctor. These Hippocrates kept the band of beggars waiting at their door, and then told me, for the price of one guinea, that I must bear my complaint patiently, adding, That's all, my dear sir. Dr. Goodwin, famous for his experiments relating to drowning people, made on his own person by his own prescriptions, was more generous. He assisted me with his advice gratis, but he said to me, with the harshness which he employed towards himself, that I might last a few months, perhaps one or two years, provided I gave up all fatigue. Do not look forward to a long career. That was the substance of his consultations. The certainty of my approaching end thus acquired, while increasing the natural gloom of my imagination, gave me an incredible peace of mind. This inner disposition explains a passage of the note placed at the head of the essay historique, as well as the following passage from the essay itself. Smitten as I am with an illness which leaves me little hope, I behold objects with a tranquil eye. The calm atmosphere of the tomb is perceptible to the traveller who is but a few days' march removed from it. The bitterness of the reflection spread over the essay will therefore arouse no astonishment. I wrote that work while lying under sentence of death, between the verdict and the execution, a writer who believed himself to be drawing near his end, amid the destitution of his exile, could scarcely cast a smiling glance upon the world. But how to spend the days of grace that had been granted me? I might have lived or died promptly by my sword. I was forbidden to use it. What remained? A pen? It was neither known nor proved, and I was ignorant of its power. Would my innate taste for letters, the poems of my childhood, the sketches of my travels, suffice to attract the public attention? The idea of writing a work on the comparative revolutions had occurred to me. I turned it over in my mind as a subject more suited to the interests of the day. But who would undertake the printing of a manuscript with none to extol its merits, and who would support me during the composition of that manuscript? Even if I had but a few days to spend on earth, I must nevertheless have some means of support for those few days. My thirty louis, already seriously curtailed, could not go very far, and, in addition to my own distress, I had to support the general distress of the emigration. My companions in London all had occupations. 
some had embarked in the coal trade others with their wives made straw hats others again taught the french which they did not know they were all merry the fault of our nation its frivolity had at that moment changed into virtue they laughed in fortune's face that thieving wench was quite abashed at carrying off something which she was not asked to restore peltier author of the domine salvum fac regem and principal editor of the arc des apotres continued his parisian enterprise in london he was not precisely vicious but he was devoured by a vermin of small faults of which it was impossible to purify him he was a rake a good-for-nothing earned a great deal of money and spent it as lavishly was at the same time the adherent of the legitimacy and the ambassador of the black king christophe to george the third diplomatic correspondent of monsieur le comte de limonade and drank up in champagne the salary which was paid him in sugar this sort of monsieur violet playing the grand airs of the revolution on a pocket violin came to see me and offered his services as a breton i spoke to him of my plan of the essay he loudly approved of it it will be superb he exclaimed and offered me a room in the house of his printer bailis who would print the work piece by piece as i wrote it de Boff, the bookseller should have the sale of it he peltier would trumpet it in his paper the ambigu while one might obtain a footing in the london courrier francais the editorship of which was soon to be transferred to m de montlosier peltier never entertained a doubt he spoke of getting me the cross of st louis for my siege of thionville my gil blau tall lean lanky with powdered hair and a bald forehead always shouting and joking put his round hat on one ear took me by the arm and carried me off to bailis the printer where without any ceremony he hired a room for me at a guinea a month i was face to face with my golden future but how to bridge over the present peltier obtained translations from the latin and the english for me i worked at translating by day and at night at the essai historique into which i introduced a portion of my travels and my day-dreams bailey supplied me with the books and i laid out a few shillings to ill purpose on the purchase of old volumes displayed on the bookstalls Angon, whom i had met on the jersey packet had become intimate with me he cultivated literature he was well informed and he wrote novels in secret and read me pages of them he had a lodging not far from bailey's at the end of a street leading into holborn i breakfasted with him every morning at ten o'clock we talked about politics and above all about my work i told him how much i had built up my nocturnal edifice the essay then i reverted to my labour of the daytime the translations we met for dinner at a shilling a head in a public-house thence we made for the fields often also we walked alone for we were both of us fond of musing i would then direct my steps towards kensington or westminster kensington pleased me i wandered about its solitary part while the part adjacent to hyde park became filled with a brilliant multitude the contrast between my penury and the display of wealth between my destitution and the crowd was pleasant to me i watched the young englishwoman pass in the distance with that sense of desirous confusion which myself had formerly caused me to feel when after decking her with all my extravagances i scarce dared lift my eyes upon my handiwork death which i thought that i was approaching added a mystery to this vision of a world from which i had almost departed did ever look rest upon the foreigner seated at the foot of a fir-tree did some fair woman divine the invisible presence of renee at westminster i found a different pastime in that labyrinth of tombs i thought of mine ready to open the bust of an unknown man like myself would never find a place amid those illustrious effigies then appeared the sepulchres of the monarchs cromwell was there no longer and charles i was not there the ashes of a traitor robert of artois lay beneath the flagstones which i trod with my loyal steps the fate of charles i had just been extended to louis the sixteenth the steel was reaping its daily harvest in france and the graves of my kindred were already dug the singing of the choir and the conversation of the visitors interrupted my reflections i was not able often to repeat my visits for i was obliged to give to the guardians of those who lived no more the shilling which was necessary to me to live but then i would turn round and round outside the abbey with the rooks or stop to gaze at the steeples twins of unequal height which the setting sun stained red with its fiery light against the black hangings of the smoke of the city one day however it happened that wishing towards evening to contemplate the interior of the basilica i became lost in admiration of its spirited and capricious architecture dominated by the sentiment of the dowdy vastity of our churches i wandered with slow footsteps and became benighted the doors were closed i tried to find an outlet i called the usher i knocked against the doors 
all the noise i made spread and spun out in the silence was lost i had to resign myself to sleeping among the dead after hesitating in my choice of a resting-place i stopped near lord chatham's mausoleum at the foot of the rood and of the double stair of henry the seventh and the ninth chapel at the entrance to those stairs to those aisles enclosed with railings a sarcophagus built into the wall opposite to a marble figure of death armed with its scythe offered me its shelter the fold of a winding-sheet also of marble served me for a niche following the example of charles v i inured myself to my burial i was in the best seats for seeing the world as it is what a mass of greatnesses were confined beneath those vaults what remains of them afflictions are no less vain than felicities the hapless jane grey is not different from the blithe alice of salisbury save that the skeleton is less horrible because it has no head her body is beautified by her punishment and by the absence of that which constituted its beauty the tournaments of the victor of crecy the sports of the field of the cloth of gold of henry the eighth will not be renewed in that theatre of funereal spectacles bacon newton milton i interred as deeply have passed away as completely as their more obscure contemporaries should i an exile a vagabond a pauper consent to be no longer the petty forgotten sorrowful thing that i am in order to have been one of those famous mighty pleasure-sated dead ah life is not all that if from the shores of this world we cannot distinctly discern matters divine let us not be astonished time is a veil set between ourselves and god even as our eyelids are interposed between our eyes and the light crouching under my marble sheet i descended from these lofty thoughts to the simple impressions of the place and moment my anxiety mingled with pleasure was analogous to that which i used to experience in winter in my turret at combourg as i listened to the wind a breeze and a shadow possess a kindred nature little by little i grew accustomed to the darkness and distinguished the figures placed over the tombs i looked up at the vaults of this english saint denis whence one might say that the years that have been and the issues of the past hung down like gothic lamps the entire edifice was as it were a monolithic temple of ages turned to stone i had counted ten o'clock eleven o'clock by the abbey clock the hammer rising and falling upon the bell-metal was the only living creature in those regions beside myself outside the sound of a carriage the voice of the watchman that was all those distant sounds of earth reached me as though from one world to another the fog from the thames and the smoke of coal crept into the basilica and spread a denser dusk around at last a twilight spread out in a corner filled with the dimmer shadows with fixed gaze i watched the progressive growth of the light did it emanate from the two sons of edward the fourth assassinated by their uncle the great tragedian says o oh, thus quoth dighton lay the gentle babes thus thus quoth forest girdling one another within their alabaster innocent arms their lips were four red roses on a stalk which in their summer beauty kissed each other god did not send me those two sad and charming souls but the light phantom of a scarcely adolescent woman appeared carrying a light sheltered in a sheet of paper twisted shell-wise it was the little bell-ringer i heard the sound of a kiss and the bell tolled the break of day the ringer was quite terrified when i went out with her through the gate of the cloisters i told her of my adventure she said she had come to do duty for her father who was sick we did not speak of the kiss i amused angel with the story of my adventure and we made a plan to lock ourselves in at westminster but our distress summoned us to the dead in a less poetic manner my funds were becoming exhausted bailis and de boff had ventured against a written promise of reimbursement in case of non-sale to commence the printing of the essay there their generosity ended and very naturally i was even astonished at their boldness the translations fell off peltier a man of pleasure grew weary of his prolonged obligingness he would willingly have given me what he had if he had not preferred to squander it but to go looking here and there for work to do patient acts of kindness was beyond him Angon also saw his treasure diminishing we were reduced to sixty francs between us we cut down our rations as on a vessel when the passage is prolonged instead of a shilling apiece we spent only sixpence on our dinner with our morning tea we reduced the bread by one half and suppressed the butter this abstinence vexed my friend's nerves his wit went wool-gathering he would prick his ears and seem to be listening to some one he would burst out laughing in reply or shed tears Angon believed in magnetism and had disordered his brain with swedenborg's rubbish 
he told me in the morning that he had heard noises during the night if i denied his fancies he grew angry the anxiety which he caused me prevented me from feeling my own sufferings these were great nevertheless that rigorous diet combined with the work chafed my diseased chest i began to find a difficulty in walking and yet i spent my days and a part of my nights out of doors so as not to betray my distress when we came to our last shilling my friend and i agreed to keep it in order to make a pretence of breakfasting we arranged that we should buy a penny roll that we should have the hot water and the teapot brought up as usual that we should not put in any tea that we should not eat the bread but that we should drink the hot water with a few little morsels of sugar left at the bottom of the bowl five days passed in this fashion i was devoured with hunger i burned with fever sleep had deserted me i sucked pieces of linen which i soaked in water i chewed grass and paper when i passed the baker's shops the torment i endured was horrible one rough winter's night i stood for two hours outside a shop where they sold dried fruits and smoked meats swallowing all i saw with my eyes i could have eaten not only the provisions but the boxes and baskets in which they were packed on the morning of the fifth day dropping from inanition i dragged myself to angles i knocked at the door it was closed i called out Angon was some time without answering at last he rose and opened the door he laughed with a bewildered air his frock coat was buttoned he sat down at the tea-table our breakfast is coming he said in a strange voice i thought i saw some stains of blood on his shirt i suddenly unbuttoned his coat he had given himself a wound with a penknife two inches deep in his left breast i called out for help the maid-servant went to fetch a surgeon the wound was dangerous this new misfortune obliged me to take a resolution Angon, who was a counsellor to the parliament of brittany had refused to take the salary which the english government allowed the french magistrates in the same way that i had declined the shilling a day doled out to the emigrants i wrote to m de barentin and disclosed my friend's position to him Angon's relations hurried to his assistance and took him away to the country at that very moment my uncle de bedet forwarded me forty crowns a touching offering from my persecuted family i seemed to see all the gold of peru before my eyes the might of the french prisoner supported the exiled frenchman my destitution had impeded my work as i delivered no more manuscript the printing was suspended deprived of Angon's company i did not keep on my room at bailey's at a guinea per month i paid the quarter that was due and went away below the needy emigrants who had served as my first protectors in london were others who were even more necessitous there are degrees among the poor as among the rich one can go from the man who in winter keeps himself warm with his dog down to him who shivers in his torn rags my friends found me a room more suited to my diminishing fortune one is not always at the height of prosperity they installed me in the neighbourhood of marlbone street in a garret whose dormer window overlooked a cemetery every night the watchman's rattle told me of the proximity of body snatchers i had the consolation to hear that Angon was out of danger friends came to see me in my workroom to judge from our independence and our poverty we might have been taken for painters on the ruins of rome we were artists in wretchedness on the ruins of france my face served as a model my bed as a seat for my pupils the bed consisted of a mattress and a blanket i had no sheets when it was cold my coat and a chair added to my blanket kept me warm i was too weak to make my bed it remained turned down as god had left it my cousin de la boetarde turned out of a low irish lodging for not paying his rent although he had put his violin in pawn came to ask me for shelter against the constable a vicar from lower brittany lent him a trestle bed la boetarde like Angon, had been a counsellor to the parliament of brittany he did not possess a handkerchief to tie round his head but he had deserted with bag and baggage that is to say he had brought away his square cap and his red robe and he slept under the purple by my side jocular a good musician with a fine voice on nights when we could not sleep he would sit up quite naked on his trestles put on his square cap and sing ballads accompanying himself on a guitar with only three strings one night when the poor fellow was in this way humming chandu propizia from metastasio's hymn to venus he was struck by a draught he twisted his mouth and he died of it but not at once for i rubbed his cheek heartily we held counsel in our elevated room argued on politics and discussed the gossip of the emigration in the evening we went to our aunts and cousins to dance after the dresses had been trimmed with ribbons and the hats made up they who read this portion of my memoirs are not aware that i have interrupted them twice once to offer a great dinner to the duke of york brother of the king of england 
and wants to give a rout on the anniversary of the entry of the king of france into paris on the eighth of july that rout cost me forty thousand francs peers and peeresses of the british empire ambassadors distinguished foreigners filled my gorgeously decorated rooms my tables gleamed with the glitter of london crystal and the gold of served porcelain the most delicate dainties wines and flowers abounded portland place was blocked with splendid carriages collinet and the band from almax enraptured the fashionable melancholy of the dandies and the dreamy elegance of the pensively dancing ladies the opposition and the ministerial majority had struck a truce mrs canning talked to lord londonderry lady jersey to the duke of wellington monsieur who this year sent me his compliments on the sumptuousness of my entertainments in eighteen twenty two did not know in seventeen ninety three that not far from him lived a future minister who while awaiting the advent of his greatness fasted over a cemetery for his sin of loyalty i congratulate myself to-day on having experienced shipwreck gone through war and shared the sufferings of the humblest classes of society as i applaud myself for meeting with injustice and calumny in times of prosperity i have profited by these lessons life without the ills that make it serious is a child's bauble i was the man with the forty crowns but since fortunes had not yet been levelled nor the price of commodities reduced there was nothing to serve as a counterpoise to my rapidly diminishing purse i could not reckon on further help from my family exposed in brittany to the double scourge of the shore and the terror i saw nothing before me but the workhouse or the thames some of the emigrant servants whom their masters could no longer feed had turned into eating-house keepers in order to feed their masters god knows the merry meals that were made at these ordinaries god knows too what politics were talked there all the victories of the republic were turned into defeats and if by chance one entertained a doubt as to an immediate restoration he was declared a jacobin two old bishops who looked like live corpses were walking one morning in st james's park monseigneur said one do you think we shall be in france by june why monseigneur replied the other after ripe reflection i see nothing against it peltier the man of resource unearthed me or rather unnested me in my eyrie he had read in a yarmouth newspaper that a society of antiquarians was going to produce a history of the county of suffolk and that they wanted a frenchman able to decipher some french twelfth-century manuscripts from the camden collection the parson at beckles was at the head of the undertaking he was the man to whom to apply that will just suit you said peltier go down there decipher that old waste paper go on sending copy for the essay de bailis i'll make the wretch go on with his printing and you will come back to london with two hundred guineas in your pocket your work done and go ahead i tried to stammer out some objections what the deuce cried my man do you want to stay in this palace where i am catching cold already if we were all chansonnettes mirabeau tonneau and i had gone about pursing up our mouths a fine business we should have made of the act des apotres do you know that that story of Angot is making the devil of a to-do so you both wanted to let yourself die of hunger did you ha 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 poof ha ha peltier doubled in two was holding his knees with laughter he had just received a hundred subscriptions to his paper from the colonies he had been paid for them and jingled his guineas in his pocket he dragged me by main force together with the apoplectic la Buetale and two tattered emigrants who were at hand to dine at the london tavern he made us drink port and eat roast beef and plum pudding till we were ready to burst monsieur le comte he asked my cousin what makes you carry your potato trap askew like that la Buetale, half shocked half pleased explained the thing as best he could he described how he had been suddenly seized while singing the words o bella venere my poor paralytic looked so dead so benumbed so shabby as he stammered out his bella venere that peltier fell back roaring with laughter and almost upset the table by striking it with his two feet underneath upon reflection the advice of my fellow-countryman a real character out of my other fellow-countryman le sage did not appear to me so bad after three days spent in making inquiries and in obtaining some clothes from peltier's tailor i set out for beckles with some money lent me by devoff on the understanding that i was going on with the essay i changed my name which no englishman was able to pronounce for that of combourg which had been borne by my brother and which reminded me of the sorrows and pleasures of my early youth i alighted at the inn and handed the minister of the place a letter from deboff who was greatly esteemed in the english book world the letter recommended me as a scholar of the first rank i was very well received saw all the gentlemen of the district and met two officers of our royal navy who were giving french lessons in the neighbourhood my strength improved my trips on horseback restored my health a little 
england viewed thus in detail was melancholy but charming it was the same thing the same outlook wherever i went m de combourg was invited to every party i owed to study the first alleviation of my lot cicero was right to recommend the commerce of letters in the troubles of life the women were delighted to meet a frenchman to talk french with the misfortunes of my family which i learned from the newspapers and which made me known by my real name for i was unable to conceal my grief increased the interest which my acquaintances took in me the public journals announced the death of m de malesherbes of his daughter madame la présidente de rosambo of his granddaughter madame de chateaubriand and of his grandson-in-law the comte de chateaubriand my brother all immolated together on the same day at the same hour on the same scaffold m de malesherbes was an object of admiration and veneration among the english my family connection with the defender of louis the sixteenth added to the kindness of my hosts my uncle de Bede informed me of the persecutions endured by the rest of my relations my old and incomparable mother had been flung into a cart with other victims and carried from the depths of brittany to the jails of paris in order to share the lot of the son whom she had loved so well my wife and my sister lucile were awaiting their sentence in the dungeons at rennes there had been a question of imprisoning them at combourg castle which had become a state fortress their innocence was accused of the crime of my emigration what were our sorrows on foreign soil compared with those of the french who had remained at home and yet what unhappiness amid the sufferings of exile to know that our very exile was made the pretext for the persecution of our kin two years ago my sister-in-law's wedding-ring was picked up in the kennel of the rue cassette it was brought to me broken the two hoops of the ring had come apart and hung linked together the names were clearly legible engraved inside how had the ring come to be found there when and where had it been lost had the victim imprisoned at the luxembourg passed by the rue cassette on her way to execution had she dropped the ring from the tumbrel had the ring been torn from her finger after the execution i was shocked at the sight of this symbol which both by its broken condition and its inscription reminded me of a destiny so cruel something fatal and mysterious was attached to this ring which my sister-in-law seemed to send me from among the dead in memory of herself and my brother i have given it to her son may it not bring him ill luck cher orphelin image de ta mère au ciel pour toi je le mens ici bas les jours heureux retranchés à ton père et les enfants que ton oncle n'a pas this halting stanza and two or three others are the only present i was able to make my nephew on his marriage another relic remains to me of these misfortunes the following is a letter which m de contencin wrote to me when in turning over the city records he found the order of the revolutionary tribunal which sent my brother and his family to the scaffold monsieur le vicomte there is a sort of cruelty in awaking in a mind that has suffered much the memory of the ills which have affected it most painfully this consideration made me hesitate some time before offering for your acceptance a very pathetic document upon which i alighted in the course of my historical researches it is a death certificate signed before the deceased by a man who always displayed himself as implacable as death itself whenever he found illustriousness and virtue united in the same person i hope monsieur le vicomte that you will not take it too ill of me if i add to your family records a document which recalls such cruel memories i presume that it would have an interest for you since it had a value in my eyes and i at once thought of offering it to you if i am not guilty of an indiscretion i shall be doubly gratified as this proceeding gives me the opportunity to express to you the feelings of profound respect and sincere admiration with which you have long inspired me and with i am monsieur le vicomte your most humble obedient servant a de contencin prefecture of the seine paris twenty eighth march eighteen thirty five i replied to the above letter as follows i had had the saint chapelle search monsieur for the documents concerning the trial of my unfortunate brother and his wife but the order which you have been good enough to send me was not to be found this order and so many others with their erasures and their mangled names have doubtless been presented to fouquier before the tribunal of god he will have been compelled to acknowledge his signature those are the times which people regret and on which they write volumes filled with admiration for the rest i envy my brother he at least has since many a long year quitted this sad world i thank you infinitely monsieur for the esteem which you have shown me in your beautiful and noble letter and i beg you to accept the assurance of the very distinguished consideration with which i have the honour to be etc this death order is above all remarkable for the proof of which it affords of the levity with which the murders were committed names are wrongly spelt others are effaced 
these defects of form which would have been enough to stay the simplest sentence did not stop the headsman all they cared for was the exact hour of death at five o'clock precisely here is the authentic document i copy it faithfully executor of criminal judgments revolutionary tribunal the executor of criminal judgments will not fail to go to the house of justice of the conciergerie there to execute the judgment which condemns mousset d'espremenil chapelier touré hell lamoignon Marzerbe, the woman le pelletier rosambo chateaubriand and his wife proper name effaced and illegible the widow du chatelet the wife of gramont formerly duke the woman rochechouart and parmentier fourteen to the penalty of death the execution will take place to-day at five o'clock precisely on the place de la revolution in this city h q fouquier public prosecutor given at the tribunal three floreal year two of the french republic two conveyances the ninth thermidor saved my mother's days but she was forgotten at the conciergerie the conventional commissary found her what are you doing here citizeness he asked who are you why do you stay here my mother replied that having lost her son she had not inquired what was going on and that it was indifferent to her whether she died in prison or elsewhere but perhaps you have other children said the commissary my mother mentioned my wife and sisters detained in custody at rennes an order was sent to place them at liberty and my mother was compelled to leave the prison in the histories of the revolution the writers have omitted to set the picture of outer france by the side of the picture of inner france to depict that great colony of exiles changing its industry and its sorrows in accordance with the diversity of climate and the difference in national manners outside france everything operated by individuals changes of condition obscure afflictions noiseless and unrewarded sacrifices and in this variety of individuals of every rank age and sex one fixed idea was preserved that of old france travelling with her prejudices and her faithful sons as formerly the church of god had wandered over the earth with her virtues and her martyrs inside france everything operated in the mass barere announcing murders and conquests civil wars and foreign wars the gigantic combats of the vendee and on the banks of the rhine thrones toppling to the sound of the march of our armies our fleets followed up by the waves the people disinterring the monarchs at st denis and flinging the dust of the dead kings into the eyes of the living kings to blind them new france glorying in her new-found liberties proud even of her crimes steadfast on her own soil while extending her frontiers doubly armed with the headsman's blade and the soldier's sword in the midst of my family sorrows i received some letters from my friend angel to reassure me as to his fate letters very remarkable in themselves he wrote to me in september seventeen ninety five your letter of the twenty third of august is full of the most touching feeling i showed it to a few people whose eyes filled with tears on reading it i was almost tempted to say what diderot said on the day when j j rousseau came and cried in his prison at vincent see how my friends love me my illness as a matter of fact was only one of those nervous fevers which cause great suffering and for which time and patience are the best remedies during the fever i read extracts from the phaedo and timaeus and i said with cato it must be so plato thou reasonest well i had formed an idea of my journey as one might form an idea of a voyage to india i imagined that i should see many new objects in the spirit world as swedenborg calls it and above all that i should be free from the fatigue and dangers of the journey eight miles from beckles in a little town called bungay lived an english clergyman the rev mr ives a great hellenist and mathematician he had a wife who was still young with a charming appearance mind and manners and an only daughter fifteen years of age i was introduced to this household and was better received there than anywhere else we took our wine in the old english fashion and sat two hours at table after the ladies had left mr ives who had been to america liked to tell of his travels to hear the story of my own to talk of newton and homer his daughter who had become learned in order to please her father was an excellent musician and sang as madame pasta sings to-day she reappeared in time to pour out tea and charmed away the old parson's infectious drowsiness leaning against the end of the piano i listened to miss ives in silence when the music was over the young lady questioned me about france about literature asked me to set her plans of studies she wished particularly to know the italian authors and begged me to give her some notes on the divina commedia and the gerusalemme gradually i began to experience a timid charm that issued from the soul i had decked the floridans i should not have ventured to pick up miss ives glove i grew confused when i tried to translate a passage from tasso 
I was more at my ease with that chaster and more masculine genius, Dante. Charlotte Ives's age and my own were suited. Into friendships formed in the midst of one's career, there enters a certain melancholy. When two people do not meet at the very outset, the memories of the person beloved are not mingled with that portion of our days in which we breathed without knowing her. Those days, which belong to another society, are painful to the memory, and as though curtailed from our existence. When there is a disproportion of age, the drawbacks increase. The older of the two commenced life before the younger was born. The younger is destined to remain alone in his turn. One has walked in a solitude this side of a cradle. The other will cross a solitude that side of a tomb. The past was a desert for the first. The future will be a desert for the second. It is difficult to be in love in all the conditions that produce happiness. Youth, beauty, seasonable time, harmony of hearts, tastes, character, graces, and years. Having had a fall from my horse, I stayed some time with Mr. Ives. It was winter. The dreams of my life began to flee before reality. Miss Ives became more reserved. She ceased to bring me flowers. She would no longer sing. If I could have been told that I should pass the rest of my life unknown in the bosom of this retiring family, I should have died of pleasure love needs but permanency to become at once an eden before the fall and an ozana without end contrive that beauty lasts that youth remains that the heart can never weary and you reproduce heaven love is so surely the sovereign felicity that it is pursued by the phantom of perpetuity it will consent to pronounce only irrevocable vows in the absence of joys it seeks to make endless its sorrows a fallen angel, it still speaks the language it spoke in the incorruptible abode. Its hope is that it may never cease. In its twofold nature and its twofold delusion here below, it strives to perpetuate itself by immortal thoughts and never failing generations. I beheld with dismay the moment approach when I should be obliged to go. On the eve of the day announced for my departure, our dinner was a gloomy one. To my great surprise, Mr. Ives withdrew at dessert, taking his daughter with him and I remained alone with Mrs. Ives. She was extremely embarrassed. I thought she was going to reproach me with an inclination which she might have discovered, although I had never mentioned it. She looked at me, lowered her eyes, blushed, herself bewitching in her confusion. There was no sentiment which she might not by right have claimed for herself. At last, overcoming with an effort the obstacle which had prevented her from speaking, Sir, she said in English, you behold my confusion. I do not know if Charlotte pleases you, but it is impossible to deceive a mother's eyes. My daughter has certainly conceived an attachment for you. Mr. Ives and I have consulted together. You suit us in every respect. We believe you will make our daughter happy. You no longer possess a country. You have lost your relations. Your property is sold. What is there to take you back to France? Until you inherit what we have, you will live with us. Of all the sorrows that I had undergone, this was the sorest and greatest. I threw myself at Mrs. Ives's feet. I covered her hands with my kisses and my tears. She thought I was weeping with happiness, and herself began to sob for joy. She stretched out her arm to pull the bell-rope. She called her husband and daughter. Stop! I cried. I am a married man. She fell back, fainting. I went out, and, without returning to my room, left the house on foot. I reached Beckles and took the mail for London, after writing a letter to Mrs. Ives, of which I regret that I did not keep a copy. I have retained the sweetest, the tenderest, the most grateful recollection of that event. Before I made my name, Mr. Ives's family was the only one that bore me good will, and welcomed me with genuine affection. Poor, unknown, prescribed, with neither beauty nor attraction, I was offered an assured future, a country, a charming wife, to take me out of my loneliness, a mother almost as beautiful to fill the place of my old mother, a father full of information, loving and cultivating literature, to replace the father of whom heaven had bereaved me. What did I bring to set off against all that? No illusion could possibly enter into the choice they made of me. There was no doubt that I was loved. Since that time, I have met with but one attachment sufficiently lofty to inspire me with the same confidence. As to any interest of which I may subsequently have been the object, I have never been able to make up whether outward causes, a noisy fame, official finery, the glamour of a high literary or political position, were not the covering which attracted the attention shown to me. For the rest, if I had married Charlotte Ives, my part on earth would have been changed. Buried in an English county, I should have become a sporting gentleman. Not a single line would have fallen from my pen. I should even have forgotten my language. For I wrote in English, and my ideas were beginning to take shape in English in my head. Would my country have lost much by my disappearance? If I could put on one side that which has consoled me, 
I would say that I should already have numbered days of calm, instead of the troubled days that have fallen to my share. The empire, the restoration, the divisions and quarrels of France, what would all that have mattered to me? I should not each morning have to palliate faults, to contend with errors. Is it certain that I possess a real talent, and that that talent is worth the sacrifice of my whole life? Shall I outlast my tomb? If I do go beyond it, in the transformation which is now being brought about, in a changed world occupied with very different things, will there be a public to hear me? Shall I not be a man of the past, unintelligible to the new generations? Will not my ideas, my opinions, my very style, seem tedious and antiquated to a scornful posterity? Will my shade be able to say, as the shade of Virgil said to Dante, Poeta fui e cantai, I was a poet, and I sang. I returned to London, but found no repose. I had fled from my fate as a miscreant from his crime. How painful it must have been to a family so worthy of my homage, of my respect, of my gratitude, to receive a sort of refusal from the unknown man whom they had welcomed, to whom they had offered a new home with a simplicity, an absence of suspicion, of precaution, almost patriarchal in character. I imagined Charlotte's grief, the just reproaches with which I was liable and deserved to be covered, for, after all, I had taken pleasure in yielding to an inclination of which I knew the insuperable unlawfulness. Had I, in fact, made a vain attempt at seduction, without taking into account the heinousness of my conduct? But whether I stopped as I did in order to remain an honest man, or overcame all obstacles in order to surrender to an inclination stigmatised beforehand through my conduct, I could only have plunged the object of that seduction into sorrow or regret. From these bitter reflections I abandoned myself to other thoughts no less filled with bitterness. I cursed my marriage, which, according to the false perception of a mind at that time very sick, had thrown me out of my course and was robbing me of happiness. I did not reflect that, on account of the ailing temperament to which I was subject, and the romantic notions of liberty which I cherished, a marriage with Miss Ives would have been as painful to me as a more independent union. One thing within me remained pure and charming, although profoundly sad the image of Charlotte, that image ended by prevailing over my revolts against my fate. I was tempted a hundred times to return to Bungie, not to appear before the troubled family, but to hide by the roadside to see Charlotte pass, to follow her to the temple where we had the same God, if not the same altar, in common, to offer that woman through the medium of heaven the inexpressible ardour of my vows, to pronounce at least in thought the prayer from the nuptial benediction which I might have heard from a clergyman's lips in that temple. O oh God, Look mercifully upon this thy handmaid, now to be joined in wedlock. May it be to her a yoke of love and peace. May she be fruitful in offspring, that they may both see their children's children unto the third and fourth generation, and arrive at a desired old age. Wavering between resolve and resolve, I wrote Charlotte long letters which I tore up. A few unimportant notes which I had received from her served me as a talisman, attached to my steps by my thought. Charlotte, gracious and compassionate, followed me along the paths of myself, purifying them as she went. She absorbed my faculties, she was the centre through which my intelligence made its way, in the same way as the blood passes through the heart. She disgusted me with all else, for I made of her a perpetual object of comparison to her advantage. A real and unhappy passion is a poison leaven, which remains at the bottom of the soul, and which would poison the bread of the angels. The spot by which I had wandered, the hours and words which I had exchanged with Charlotte, were engraved on my memory. I saw the smile of the wife who had been destined for me. I respectfully touched her black tresses. I pressed her shapely arms to my breast, like a chain which I might have worn round my neck. No sooner was I in some sequestered spot than Charlotte, with her white hands, came to sit by my side. I divined her presence, as at night one inhales the perfume of unseen flowers. I had lost Angon's company, and my walks, more solitary than before, left me full liberty to carry with me the image of Charlotte. There was not a common, a road, a church, within thirty miles of London, that I did not visit. The most deserted places, a field of nettles, a ditch planted with thistles, all that was neglected by men, became favourite spots for me. And in those spots Byron already drew breath. Leaning my head upon my hand, I contemplated the scorned sights, when their painful impression affected me too greatly, the memory of Charlotte came to enchant me. I was then like the pilgrim who, on reaching a solitude within view of the rocks of Mount Sinai, heard the nightingale sing. In London my habits aroused surprise. I looked at nobody, I never replied, I did not know what was said to me. My old associate suspected me of madness. 
What happened at Bungay after my departure? What became of that family to which I had brought joy and mourning? You will have remembered that I am at present ambassador to the court of George IV, and that I am writing in London in 1822 of what happened to me in London in 1795. Some matters of business obliged me a week ago to interrupt the narrative which I resume to-day. During this interval my man came and told me one morning, between twelve and one o'clock, that a carriage had stopped at my door, and that an English lady was asking to see me. As I have made it a rule in my public position to deny myself to nobody, I ordered the lady to be shown up. I was in my study when Lady Sutton was announced. I saw a lady in mourning enter the room, accompanied by two handsome boys, also in mourning. One might have been sixteen, the other fourteen years of age. I went towards the stranger. Her perturbation was such that she could hardly walk. She said to me in faltering accents, My lord, do you remember me? Yes, I remembered Miss Ives. The years which had passed over her head had left only their springtime behind. I took her by the hand, I made her sit down, and I sat down by her side. I could not speak, my eyes were full of tears. I gazed at her in silence through those tears. I felt how deeply I had loved her by what I was now experiencing. At last I was able to say in my turn, And you, madam, do you remember me? She raised her eyes, which till then she had kept lowered, and for sole reply gave me a smiling and melancholy glance like a long remembrance. Her hand still lay between mine. Charlotte said to me, I am in mourning for my mother. My father has been dead many years. These are my children. At these words she drew away her hand and sank back into her chair, covering her eyes with her handkerchief. Soon she resumed. My lord, I am now speaking to you in the language which I practice with your bungi. I am ashamed. Excuse me. My children are the sons of Admiral Sutton, whom I married three years after your departure from England, but I am not sufficiently self-possessed to-day to tell you the details. Permit me to come again. I asked her for her address, and gave her my arm to take her to her carriage. She trembled, and I pressed her hand to my heart. I called on Lady Sutton the next day. I found her alone. Then there began between us a long series of those, do you remember, questions, which cause a whole lifetime to revive. At each, do you remember, we looked at one another, we sought to discover in each other's faces those traces of time which so cruelly mark the distance from the starting point and the length of the road traversed. I said to Charlotte, How did your mother tell you? Charlotte blushed and hastily interrupted me. I have come to London to ask you to interest yourself on behalf of Admiral Sutton's children. The eldest would like to go to Bombay. Mr. Canning, who has been appointed Governor-General of India, is your friend. He might consent to take my son with him. I should be very grateful to you, and I should like to owe to you the happiness of my first child. She laid a stress on these last words. Ah, madam, I replied, of what do you remind me? What a subversion of destinies! You, who received a poor exile at your father's hospitable board, you, who did not scorn his sufferings, you, who perhaps thought of raising him to a glorious and unhoped for rank, it is you who now ask his protection in your own country. I will see Mr. Canning. Your son, however much it cost me to give him that name, your son shall go to India, if it only depends on me. But tell me, madam, how does my new position affect you? In what light do you look upon me at present? That word, my lord, which you employ, seems very harsh to me. Charlotte replied, I don't think you changed, not even aged. When I spoke of you to my parents during your absence, I always gave you the title of my lord. It seemed to me that you had a right to bear it. Were you not to me the same as a husband, my lord and master? That graceful woman reminded me of Milton's Eve as she uttered these words. She was not born in the womb of another woman. Her beauty bore the imprint of the divine hand that had moulded it. I went to Mr. Canning and to Lord Londonderry. They made as many difficulties about a small place as would have been made in France, but they promised, as people promise at court. I gave Lady Sutton an account of the measures I had taken. I saw her three times more. At my fourth visit she told me she was returning to Bungay. This last interview was a sad one. Charlotte taught me once more of the past, of our secret life, of our reading, our walks, our music, the flowers of yesteryear, the hopes of bygone days. When I knew you, she said, no one spoke your name. Now, who has not heard it? Do you know that I have a work and several letters in your handwriting? Here they are. And she handed me a packet. Do not be offended if I prefer to keep nothing of yours. She began to weep. Farewell, farewell, she said. Think of my son. 
i shall not see you again for you will not come to see me at bungay i will i cried i shall come to bring you your son's appointment she shook her head with an air of doubt and withdrew on returning to the embassy i locked myself in and opened the packet it contained only a few unimportant notes from myself and a scheme of studies with remarks on the english and italian poets i had hoped to find a letter from charlotte there was none but in the margins of the manuscript i perceived some notes in english french and italian the age of the ink and the youthfulness of the hand in which they were written showed that it was long since they had been inscribed upon those margins that is the story of my relations with miss ives as i finish telling it it seems to me as though i were losing a second charlotte in the same island in which i lost the first but between that which i feel at this moment and that which i felt at the hours whose tenderness i have recalled lies the whole space of innocence passions have interposed themselves between miss ives and lady sutton i could no longer bring to an artless woman the candour of desire the sweet ignorance of a love that did not surpass the limits of a dream i was writing then on the wave of sadness i am now no longer tossed on the wave of life well if i had pressed in my arms as a wife and a mother her who was destined for me as a virgin and a bride it would have been with a sort of rage to blight to fill with sorrow to crush out of existence those seven-and-twenty years which had been given to another after having been offered to me i must look upon the sentiment which i have just recalled as the first of that kind which entered my heart it was nevertheless in no way sympathetic with my stormy nature the latter would have corrupted it and made me incapable of long enjoying such sacred delectations it was then that embittered as i was by misfortunes already a pilgrim from beyond the seas having begun my solitary travels it was then that i became obsessed by the mad ideas depicted in the mystery of rene which turned me into the most tormented being on the face of the earth however that may be the chaste image of charlotte by causing a few rays of true light to penetrate to the depths of my soul at first dissipated a cloud of phantoms my demon like an evil genius plunged back into the abyss and awaited the effects of time in order to renew her apparitions End of book eight, part one. Part two, book eight of part one of the memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume two, part one, by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book eight, part two. My relations with de Boff in connection with the essay sur la Revolution had never been completely interrupted and it was important for me to resume them in london at the earliest possible moment to support my material existence but whence had my last misfortune arisen from my obstinate bent for silence in order to understand this it is necessary to enter into my character at no time of my life have i been able to overcome the spirit of reticence and of mental solitude which prevents me from talking of my private affairs no one can state without lying that i have told what most people tell in a moment of pain pleasure or vanity a name a confession of any seriousness never issues or issues but rarely from my lips i never talk to casual people of my interests my plans my work my ideas my attachments my joys my sorrows being persuaded of the profound weariness which one causes to others by talking of oneself sincere and truthful though i be i am lacking in openness of heart my soul incessantly tends to close up i do not tell anything wholly and i have never allowed my complete life to transpire except in these memoirs if i try to begin a story i am suddenly terrified at the idea of its length after four words the sound of my voice becomes unendurable to me and i am silent as i believe in nothing except religion i distrust everything malevolence and disparagement are the two distinctive qualities of the french mind derision and calumny the certain result of a confidence but what have i gained by my reserved nature to become because i was impenetrable a fantastic something having no relation with my real being my very friends are mistaken in me when they think that they are making me better known and when they adorn me with the illusions of their love for me all the small intellects of the antechambers the public offices the newspapers the cafes have assigned ambition to me whereas i have none at all cold and dry in matters of everyday life i have nothing of the enthusiast or the sentimentalist my clear and swift perception quickly pierces men and facts and strips them of all importance 
far from carrying me away from idealizing apposite truths my imagination disparages the loftiest events and baffles even myself i see the petty and ridiculous side of things first of all great geniuses and great things scarcely exist in my eyes while i show myself polite encomiastic and full of admiration for the self-conceited minds which proclaim themselves superior intelligences my secret contempt laughs at all those faces intoxicated with incense and covers them with cayo masks in politics the warmth of my opinions has never exceeded the length of my speech or my pamphlet in the inner and theoretical life i am the man of all the dreams in the outer and practical life i am the man of realities adventurous and orderly passionate and methodical i am the most chimerical and the most positive the most ardent and the most icy being that ever existed a whimsical androgynous formed out of the different blood of my mother and my father the portraits utterly without resemblance that have been made of me are due in the main to the reticence of my speech the crowd is too thoughtless too inattentive to see individuals as they are whenever by chance i have endeavoured to rectify some of these false judgments in my prefaces i have not been believed in the ultimate result all things being indifferent to me i have not insisted and as you please has always rid me of the irksomeness of persuading any one or of seeking to establish a truth i return to my spiritual tribunal like a hare to its form there i resume my contemplation of the moving leaf or the bending blade of grass i do not make a virtue of my guardedness which is as invincible as it is involuntary although it is not deceitful it has the appearance of being so it is not in harmony with natures happier more amiable more facile more candid more ample more communicative than mine it has often injured me in matters of sentiment and business because i have never been able to endure explanations reconciliations brought about by protests and elucidations lamentations and tears verbiage and reproaches details and apologies in the case of the ives family this obstinate silence of mine concerning myself proved extremely fatal to me a score of times charlotte's mother had inquired into my family and given me the opportunity of speaking openly not foreseeing whither my silence would lead me i contented myself as usual with replying in short vague sentences had i not been the victim of that odious mental perversity all misunderstanding would have become impossible and i should not have appeared to wish to deceive the most generous hospitality the truth as i told it at the last moment did not excuse me genuine harm had none the less been done i resumed my work in the midst of my grief and of the just reproaches with which i covered myself i even took pleasure in this work for it struck me that by achieving renown i should be giving the ives family less cause to repent the interest which they had shown me charlotte with whom i thus sought to be reconciled through my glory presided over my studies her image was seated before me while i wrote when i raised my eyes from the paper i lifted them upon the adored image as though the original were in fact there the inhabitants of ceylon one morning saw the luminary of day rise in extraordinary splendour its orb opened out and from it issued a dazzling being who said to the singalese i have come to reign over you charlotte issuing from a ray of light reigned over me let us leave these memories memories grow old and dim like hopes my life is about to change to speed under other skies in other valleys first love of my youth you flee with all your charms i have just seen charlotte again it is true but after how many years did i see her again sweet glimpse of the past pale rose of the twilight which borders the night long after the sun has set life has often been represented by me first of all as a mountain which we climb on one side and descend on the other it would be as true to compare it to an alp to the bare ice-crowned summit which has no reverse following up this figure the traveller always climbs upwards and never down he then sees more clearly the space which he has covered the paths which he has not taken although by doing so he could have risen by a gentler slope he looks down with sorrow and regret upon the point where he commenced to stray thus i must mark at the publication of the essay historique the first step which led me out of the peaceful road i finished the first part of the great work which i had planned i wrote the last word between the idea of death i had fallen ill again and a vanished dream insomnis venit imago conjugis and the essay printed by baylis was published by de boff in seventeen ninety seven this date marks one of the turning points in my life there are moments at which our destiny whether because it yields to society or obeys the laws of nature or begins to make us what we shall have to remain suddenly turns aside from its first line 
like a river which changes its course with a sudden bend the essay offers the compendium of my existence as a poet a moralist publicist and a politician to say that i hoped in so far at least as i am capable of hoping to make a great success with the work goes without saying we authors petty prodigies of a prodigious era make a claim to keep up intelligence with future races but we do not i firmly believe know where posterity lives and we put the wrong address when we grow numb in our graves death will freeze our words written or sung so hard that they will not melt like the frozen words of rabelais the essay was to be a sort of historical encyclopaedia the only volume published is in itself a fairly wide inquiry i had the sequel in manuscript then came beside the researches and annotations of the analyst the lays and roundelays of the poet the natchez and so on i am hardly able to understand to-day how i could give myself up to such extensive studies amid an active wandering life subject to so many reverses my obstinacy in working explains this fertility in my young days i often wrote for twelve or fifteen hours without leaving the table at which i sat scratching out and recommencing the same page ten times over age has not caused me to lose any part of this faculty of application to this day my diplomatic correspondence which in no way interrupts my literary composition is entirely from my own hand the essay made a stir among the emigration it was opposed to the opinions of my companions in misfortune in the different social positions which i have occupied my independence has nearly always offended the men with whom i went i have by turns been the leader of different armies of which the soldiers did not belong to my side i have led the old royalists to the conquest of the public liberties and especially of the liberty of the press which they detested i have rallied the liberals in the name of that same liberty to the standard of the bourbons whom they hold in abhorrence as it happened emigrant opinion attached itself to my person through self-love the english reviews having spoken of me with praise the commendation was reflected over the whole body of the faithful i had sent copies of the essay to laup ganganet and de salle lemire nephew of the poet of the same name and translator of gray's poems wrote to me from paris on the fifteenth of july seventeen ninety seven that my essay had had the greatest success one thing is certain that if the essay became for a moment known it was almost immediately forgotten a sudden shadow swallowed up the first ray of my glory as i had become almost a personage the upper emigration began to seek me out in london i made my way from street to street i first left holborn and tottenham court road and advanced as far as the hampstead road here i stopped for some months at the house of mrs o'larry an irish widow the mother of a very pretty daughter of fourteen and tenderly devoted to cats linked by this common passion we had the misfortune to lose two beautiful kittens white all over like two ermines with black tips to their tails mrs o'larry was visited by old ladies of the neighbourhood with whom i was obliged to drink tea in the old-fashioned style madame de steel has depicted this scene in corinne at lady edgemond's my dear do you think the water has boiled long enough to pour it on the tea my dear i think it is a little too early there also came to these evenings a tall and beautiful young irishwoman called mary neale in the charge of her guardian she noticed a wound lurking in my gaze for she said to me you carry your heart in a sling i carried my heart anyhow mrs o'larry left for dublin then moving once more from the neighbourhood of the colony of the poor emigration of the east i arrived from lodging to lodging in the court of the rich emigration of the west among the bishops the court families and the west indian planters pertier had come back to me he had got married as a joke he was the same boaster as always lavishly obliging and frequenting his neighbours pockets rather than their society i made several new acquaintances particularly in the society in which i had family connections christian de la Magnon, who had been seriously wounded in the leg in the engagement at quiberon and who is now my colleague in the house of lords became my friend he presented me to mrs lindsay who was attached to auguste de la Magnon, his brother the president guillaume was not installed in this fashion at basseville in the midst of boileau madame de sevigne and bourdaloue mrs lindsay a lady of irish descent with a material mind and a somewhat snappish humour an elegant figure and attractive features was gifted with nobility of soul and elevation of character the emigrants of quality spent their evenings by the fireside of the last of the ninons the old monarchy was going under with all its abuses and all its graces it will be dug up one day like those skeletons of queens decked with necklaces bracelets and earrings which they exhume in etruria at mrs lindsay's i met m malouet and madame du belois 
a woman worthy of affection, the Comte de Montlosier and the Chevalier de Panat. The last had a well-earned reputation for wit, dirtiness, and gluttony. He belonged to that audience of men of taste who used formerly to sit with folded arms in the presence of French society, idlers whose mission was to look on at everything and criticise everything. They exercised the functions which the newspapers fulfil to-day, without the same bitterness, but also without attaining their great popular influence. Montlosier continued to ride cock-horse on his famous phrase of the wooden cross, a phrase somewhat smoothed down by me when I revived it, but true at bottom. On leaving France he went to Coblenz. He was badly received by the princes, had a quarrel, fought a duel at night on the bank of the Rhine, and was run through. Being unable to move and quite unable to see, he asked the seconds if the point of the sword was sticking out behind. Only three inches, said they, feeling him. Then it's nothing, replied Montlosier. Sir, withdraw your weapon. Thus badly received for his royalism, Montlosier went to England and took refuge in literature, the great almshouse of the emigrants, in which I had a pallet next to his. He obtained the editorship of the Courrier Francais. In addition to his newspaper, he wrote physico-politico-philosophical works. In one of these works he proved that blue is the colour of life, because our veins turn blue after death, life coming to the surface of the body, in order to evaporate and return to the blue sky. As I am very fond of blue, I was quite charmed. Feudally liberal, aristocratic and democratic, with a motley mind made up of shreds and patches, Montlosier is delivered, with difficulty, of incongruous ideas. But, once he has succeeded in extricating them from their afterbirth, they are sometimes fine, above all energetic, and anti-clerical as a noble, a Christian through sophistry, and as a lover of the olden times, he would, in the days of paganism, have been an eager partisan of freedom in theory and of slavery in practice, and would have had the slave thrown to the lampreys in the name of the liberty of the human race. Wrong-headed, cavilling, stiff-necked in her suit, the ex-deputy of the nobles of Riom, nevertheless indulges in condescendences to the powers that be. He knows how to look after his interests, but he does not suffer others to perceive this, and he shelters his weaknesses as a man beneath his honour as a gentleman. I do not wish to speak ill of my smoky overnat with his novels of the Mont d'Or, and his polemics of the plan. I like his heteroclitus person, his long and obscure setting forth and twisting of ideas, with parentheses, clearings of the throat, and tremulous, oh, ohs, bore me. I abominate the tenebrous, the involved, the vaporous, the laborious. But, on the other hand, I am amused by this naturalist of volcanoes, this abortive Pascal, this mountain orator who holds forth in the tribune, as his little fellow countrymen sing in the chimney-tops. I love this gazetteer of peat-bogs and castle-keeps, this liberal explaining the charter through a gothic window, this shepherd lord half married to his milkmaid, himself sowing his barley in the snow, in his little pebbly field. I shall always thank him for dedicating to me, in his chalet in the Prix de Dom, an old black rock taken from a cemetery of the Gauls, discovered by himself. The Abbe de Lille, another fellow countryman of Sidonius Apollinarius, of the Chancelier de l'Hospital, of Lafayette, of Thomas, of Chamfort, had also come to settle in London, after being driven from the continent by the inundation of the Republican victories. The emigration was proud to number him in its ranks. He sang our misfortunes, a reason the more for loving his muse. He did a great deal of work. He could not help himself, for Madame de Lille locked him up and did not release him until he had earned his day's keep by writing a certain number of verses. I called on him one day and was kept waiting. Then he appeared with very red cheeks. It is said that Madame de Lille used to box his ears. I know nothing about it. I only say what I saw. Who has not heard the Abbe de Lille recite his verses? He told a very good story. His ugly, irregular features, lit up by his imagination, went admirably with his affected delivery, with the character of his talent, and with his clerical profession. The Abbe de Lille's masterpiece is his translation of the Georgics, with the exception of the sentimental pieces but it is as though you are reading Racine translated into the language of Louis the Fifteenth. The literature of the eighteenth century, saving a few fine talents which dominate it, standing as it does between the classical literature of the seventeenth century and the romantic literature of the nineteenth, without lacking naturalness, lacks nature. Given up wholly to arrangements of words, it was neither sufficiently original as a new school, nor sufficiently pure as an ancient school. The Abbe de Lille was the poet of the modern country houses, in the same way as the troubadours were the poets of the old castles. The verses of the one and the ballads of the other 
point the difference which existed between aristocracy in its prime and aristocracy in its decrepitude the abbe describes the pleasures of reading and chess in the manor-houses in which the troubadours sang of tourneys and crusades the distinguished persons of our church militant were at that time in england the abbe caron who wrote the life of my sister julie the bishop of st paul de leon a stern and narrow-minded prelate who contributed more and more to estrange m le comte d'artois from his country the archbishop of aix slandered perhaps because of his success in society another learned and pious bishop but so avaricious that had he had the misfortune to lose his soul he would never have bought it back nearly all misers are men of wit i must be a great fool among the french women in the west end was madame de boigne amiable witty filled with talent extremely pretty and the youngest of them all she has since together with her father the marquis d'osmont represented the court of france in england much better than my unsociability has done she is writing now and her talents will reproduce admirably all that she has seen mesdames de Caumont, de gontaut and duc cluzel also inhabited the quarter of the exiled felicities if at least i am mistaking madame de Caumont and madame du cluzel both of whom i had seen for a moment in brussels what is quite certain is that madame la duchesse de durat was in london at that time i was not to know her till ten years later how often in one's life one passes by that which would constitute its charm even as the navigator cuts through the waters of a heaven-favoured land which he has only missed by one horizon and one day's sail i am writing this on the banks of the thames and to-day a letter will go by post to tell madame de durat on the banks of the seine that i have come across my first memory of her from time to time the revolution sent us emigrants of new kinds and opinions different layers of exiles were formed the earth contains beds of sand or clay left behind by the waves of the deluge one of those waves brought me a man whose loss i mourn to-day a man who was my guide in literature and whose friendship was both one of the honours and one of the consolations of my life you have read in an earlier book of these memoirs that i had known m de fontanes in seventeen eighty nine it was in berlin last year that i learnt the news of his death he was born at Nyon, of a noble protestant family his father had had the misfortune to kill his brother-in-law in a duel young fontanes brought up by a brother of great merit came to paris he saw voltaire die and that great representative of the eighteenth century inspired his first verses his poetic attempts attracted the notice of la harpe he undertook some work for the stage and became intimate with a charming actress mademoiselle des garcins living near the odeon wandering around the chartreuse he celebrated its solitude he had made a friend destined to become mine m joubert when the revolution occurred the poet became entangled with one of those stationary parties which always remain torn by the progressive party which pulls them forwards and the retrograde party which draws them back the monarchists attached m de fontaine to the staff of the moderator when the bad days began he took refuge at lyon where he married his wife was confined of a son during the siege of the town which the revolutionaries had called commune affranchie in the same way as louis the eleventh when banishing the citizens had called arras ville franchise madame de fontaine was obliged to move her nursling's cradle in order to place it within shelter from the bombs returning to paris after the ninth thermidor m de fontaine established the memorial with m de la harpe and the abbe de vauxelles he was prescribed on the eighteenth fructidor and england became his haven of refuge m de fontaine together with chenier was the last writer of the classic school in the elder line his prose and verse resemble each other and have a similar merit his thoughts and images have a melancholy unknown to the century of louis the fourteenth which knew only the austere and holy sadness of religious eloquence that melancholy is mingled with the works of the chanter of the jeu des morts as it were the imprint of the period in which he lived it fixes the date of his coming it shows that he was born after rousseau while connected by taste with fenelon if the writings of m de fontaine were reduced to two very small volumes one of prose the other of verse it would be the most graceful funeral monument that could be raised upon the tomb of the classic school among the papers which my friend left are several cantos of his poem of the grès sauvé books of odes scattered poems and so on he would not have published any more himself for that critic so acute so enlightened so impartial when not blinded by his political opinions had a horrible dread of criticism he was superlatively unjust to madame de steel 
an envious article by Gara on the Forêt de Navarre almost stopped him short at the outset of his political career. Fontan, so soon as he appeared, killed the affected school of Dora, but he was unable to restore the classic school, which was hastening to its end together with the language of Racine. If one thing in the world was likely to be antipathetic to M. de Fontan, it was my manner of writing. With me began the so-called romantic school, a revolution in French literature. Nevertheless, my friend, instead of revolting against my barbarism, became enamoured of it. I could see a great wonderment on his face when I read to him fragments of the Natchez, Atala, and Vrenet. He was unable to bring those productions within the scope of the common rules of criticism, but he felt that he was entering into a new world. He saw a new form of nature. He understood a language which he could not speak. He gave me excellent advice. I owe to him such correctness of style as I possess. He taught me to respect the reader's ear. He prevented me from falling into the extravagance of invention and the ruggedness of execution of my disciples. It was a great joy to me to see him again in London, received with open arms by the emigration. They asked him for cantos from the Gress Sauve. They crowded to hear him. He came to live near me. We became inseparable. We were present together at a scene worthy of those days of misfortune. Clary, who had lately landed, read us his memoirs in manuscript. Imagine the emotion of an audience of exiles listening to the valet of Louis the Sixteenth, telling, as an eye-witness, of the sufferings and death of the prison of the temple. The directory, alarmed by Clary's memoirs, published an interpolated edition, in which it made the author talk like a lackey, and Louis the Sixteenth like a street porter. This is perhaps one of the dirtiest of all the instances of revolutionary turpitude. M. Dutel, who had charge of the affairs of M. le Comte d'Artois in London, had hastened to seek out Fontaine, the latter asked me to take him to the agent of the princes. We found him surrounded by all the defenders of the throne and the altar, who were idling about Piccadilly, by a crowd of spies and sharpers, who had escaped from Paris under various names and disguises, and by a swarm of adventurers, Belgians, Germans, Irishmen, dealers in the counter-revolution. In a corner of the crowd was a man of thirty or thirty-two, at whom nobody looked, and who himself seemed interested only in an engraving of the death of General Wolfe. Struck by his appearance, I asked who he was. One of my neighbours answered, It's nobody. It's a Vendean peasant who has brought a letter from his leaders. This man, who was nobody, had seen the deaths of Catellino, the first general of the Vendée, and a peasant like himself, Bonchamp, in whom Bayard had come to life again, Lescure, armed with a haircloth, which was not bulletproof, Delbe, shot in an armchair, his wounds not permitting him to embrace death standing, La Roche Jacquelin, whose body was ordered to be verified, in order to reassure the convention in the midst of its victories. That man, who was nobody, had assisted at two hundred captures and recaptures of towns, villages, and redoubts, at seven hundred skirmishes and seventeen pitched battles. He had fought against three hundred thousand regular troops and six or seven hundred thousand recruits and national guards. He had assisted in taking one hundred guns and fifty thousand muskets. He had passed through the infernal columns, companies of incendiaries commanded by Convencional. He had been in the midst of the ocean of fire, which, three several times, rolled its waves over the woods of the Vendée. Lastly, he had seen three hundred thousand Hercules of the Plough, the associates of his work, die, and one hundred square leagues of fertile country change into a desert of ashes. The two Frances met upon this soil levelled by them. All that remained in blood and memory of the France of the Crusades fought against the new blood and hopes of the France of the Revolution. The conqueror recognised the greatness of the conquered. Thureau, the republican general, declared that the Vendeans would take their place in history in the first rank of soldier peoples. Another general wrote to Merlin de Thionville, Troops which have beaten such Frenchmen as those may well hope to beat all other nations. The legions of Probus in their song said as much of our fathers. Bonaparte called the combats of the Vendée combats of giants. In the crowd in the parlour I was the only one to look with admiration and respect upon the representative of those ancient Jacques, who, while breaking the yoke of their lords, repelled the foreign invasion under Charles V. I seemed to see a child of the commons of the time of Charles VII, who, with the small provincial nobility, foot by foot, furrow by furrow, reconquered the soil of France. He wore the indifferent air of the savage, his look was grey and inflexible as steel rod, his lower lip trembled over his clenched teeth, his hair hung down from his head like a mass of torpid snakes, ready, however, to dart erect again. 
His arms, hanging by his sides, gave nervous jerks to a pair of huge fists slashed with sword-cuts. One would have taken him for a sawyer. His physiognomy expressed a homely rustic nature, employed by force of manners in the service of interests and ideas contrary to that nature. The native fidelity of the vassal, the Christian simple faith, were mingled with a rough plebeian independence, accustomed to value itself and to take the law into its own hands. The feeling of liberty in him seemed to be merely the consciousness of the strength of his hand and the intrepidity of his heart. He spoke no more than a lion. He scratched himself like a lion, yawned like a lion, sat on his flank like a bored lion, and seemed to dream of blood and forests. What men in every party were the French of that time, and what a race are we to-day? But the Republicans had their principle in themselves, in the midst of themselves, while the principle of the Royalists was outside France. The Vendeans sent deputations to the exiles, the giants sent to ask leaders of the pygmies. The rude messenger upon whom I gazed had seized the revolution by the throat and cried, Enter, pass behind me, she will not hurt you, she shall not move, I have got hold of her. No one was willing to pass. Then Jacques Bonhomme let go the revolution, and Charette broke his sword. While I was making these reflections on this tiller of the soil, as I had made others of a different kind at the sight of Mirabeau and Danton, Fontana obtained a private audience of him whom he pleasantly called the Controller General of Finance. He came out of it greatly satisfied, for M. Dutail had promised to encourage the publication of my works, and Fontana thought only of me. It was impossible to be a better man than he. Timid where he himself was concerned, he became all courage in matters of friendship. He proved this to me at the time of my resignation on the occasion of the death of the Duc d'Anguien. In conversation he burst into ludicrous fits of literary rage. In politics he reasoned falsely. The crimes of the convention had inspired him with a horror of liberty. He detested the newspapers, the band of false philosophers, the whole science of ideas, and he communicated that hatred to Bonaparte when he became connected with the master of Europe. We went for walks in the country. We stopped under some of those spreading elm trees scattered about the fields. Leaning against the trunk of these elms, my friend told me of his early journey to England, before the revolution, and of the verses he then addressed to two young ladies who had grown old in the shadow of the towers of Westminster, towers which he found standing as he had left them, while at their base lay buried the illusions and the hours of his youth. We often dined at some solitary tavern in Chelsea, on the Thames, where we talked of Milton and Shakespeare. They had seen what we saw. They had sat, like ourselves, on the bank of that stream, a foreign stream to us, the national stream to them. We returned to London at night by the faltering rays of the stars, drowned one after the other in the fog of the city. We reached her lodging, guided by uncertain glimmers, which scarcely showed us the road across the cold smoke, hovering red around every lamp. Thus speeds the poet's life. We saw London in detail. As an old exile, I acted as cicerone to the new recruits of banishment, which the revolution demanded, young or old. There is no legal age for misfortune. In the course of one of these excursions, we were surprised by a rainstorm, mingled with thunder, and obliged to take shelter in the passage of a mean house, of which the door had been left open by accident. There we met the Duc de Bourbon. I saw for the first time, at the Chantilly, a prince who was not yet the last of the Condes. The Duc de Bourbon, Fontaine, and I, all three outlaws, seeking a shelter from the same storm, on foreign soil, under a poor man's roof. Fata viam inveniant. Fontaine was recalled to France. He embraced me, expressing wishes for a speedy meeting. On arriving in Germany, he wrote me the following letter. 28th July, 1798. If you have experienced any regrets at my departure from London, I swear to you that mine have been no less real. You are the second person in whom, in the course of my life, I have found an imagination and a heart corresponding to my own. I shall never forget the consolation you brought me in exile and in a foreign land. My fondest and most constant thoughts, since I have left you, have turned upon the Natchez. What you have read to me, especially of recent days, is admirable, and will not leave my memory. But the charm of the poetic ideas which you left in my mind disappeared for a moment on my arrival in Germany. The most hideous news from France followed on that which I showed you on leaving you. I spent five or six days in the cruelest perplexity. I even feared for persecutions directed against my family. My fears are now greatly diminished. The evil has even been very slight. They threaten rather than strike. 
and it is not those of my date whom they wish to see exterminated the last post has brought me assurances of peace and goodwill i can continue my journey and shall set out early next month i shall live near the forest of saint germain among my family greece and my books why can i not also say the natchez the unexpected storm which has just taken place in paris was due i am certain to the follies of the agents and leaders you know of i have a clear proof of this in my hands convinced as i am of this i am writing to great pulteney street with all possible politeness but also with all the caution which prudence demands i wish to escape all correspondence in the coming month and i leave the greatest doubt upon the steps which i am going to take and the residence which i intend to select for the rest i am again speaking of you in the accents of friendship and i wish from the bottom of my heart that the hopes of future usefulness which they may place in me may revive the favourable dispositions which they showed me in this matter and which are so certainly due to your person and your great talents work work my dear friend and become illustrious you have it in your power the future is in your hands i hope that the word so often given by the controller general of finance has been at least in part redeemed that part consoles me for i cannot bear the thought of a fine work delayed for the sake of a little assistance write to me let our hearts be in communication let our muses remain ever friends do not doubt but that when i am able to move about freely in my country i shall prepare a hive and flowers for you beside my own my attachment is unalterable i shall be alone so long as i am not with you talk to me of your work i want to gladden you in conclusion i wrote half of a new canto on the banks of the elbe and i am better pleased with it than with all the rest farewell i embrace you tenderly and am your friend fontaine fontaine tells me that he wrote verses on changing the spot of his banishment one can never take everything from the poet he takes his lyre with him leave the swan his wings each evening unknown streams will re-echo the melodious plaints which he would rather have sung to eurotas the future is in your hands did fontaine speak truly am i to congratulate myself on his prophecy alas that promised future is already past shall i have another this first and affectionate letter from the first friend whom i had in my life and the friend who walked by my side for twenty-three years from the date of that letter reminds me painfully of my gradual isolation fontaine is no more a profound sorrow the tragic death of a son cast him into an untimely grave almost all the persons of whom i have spoken in these memoirs have disappeared i am keeping an obituary register a few years more and i doomed to catalogue the dead shall leave none to write my name in the book of the departed but if it must be that i remain alone if not one being who has loved me is to stay by me to lead me to my last resting-place i have less need than another of a guide i have inquired the road i have studied the places through which i should have to pass i wish to see what happens at the last moment often by the side of a pit into which a coffin was being lowered with ropes i have heard the death rattle of those ropes next i have caught the sound of the first spadeful of earth falling on the coffin at each new spadeful the hollow sound decreased the earth as it filled up the vault gradually drove the eternal silence to the surface of the grave fontaine you wrote to me let our muses remain ever friends you have not written to me in vain End of Book 8, Part 2